Okay, we are on the six constant mitzvot. We are on page 99. Idolatry, idolatry. practical, com comfortable, and meaningless. There we go. So how does this relate, this whole concept of idolatry, to our times? While the Torah's capital punishment for idolatry does not apply to the beliefs and the practices we will discuss below, the unacceptable basis underlying idolatry exists in our modern day as well. Uh, a glance at modern society reveals a world focused on practical solutions that make life simple. We no longer know how to utilize the powers of impurity to manipulate nature, but we do know how to press the buttons that will make our lives flow smoothly and practically so that we do not need to think about God. In place of a deity of stone, we have a microwave. Whereas our sister, ancestors had to toil for what month while praying to Hashem all along for rain and successful growth of their crops, we can fill our need for food by ordering it from the supermarket and popping it into a microwave. Mm. Most of our, by the way, if he would really update this book, we can go online, we can never have to leave our homes, we can order everything, it gets sent to our homes, and then we can cook it in our microwaves. <laughs> Most of our children have no idea how food is grown, how meat is processed, how grain is harvested and turned into bread. How, where do you get bread from, you ask a child? What? Just people, not children, people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but if you ask a child where does it come from, they say it came from the supermarket. Okay. The future may well bring with it a system that will be able to detect one's moods, select the dish he wants from the freezer, send it to the microwave, and have it delivered to him in bed. Now here's, by the way, an interesting midrash. I always love the midrash. When it came to the B'nai Yisrael, they were in the desert. They were in the wilderness, okay? Kids grew up in the wilderness. Forty years they were there. So what happens? Man came from, oh, Shemayim came from the heavens. Every day it fell at their tents, and that's what they grew up with. So then they're told, when you go to Eretz Yisrael, you're going to plant seeds, and it's going to grow. And they're saying, no way. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a miracle. That couldn't happen. Where does bread come from? From the Himmel, from the sky. It comes, rains down. That's where it comes from. Hamotzi lechem mina shavayim. You got the, you have it? One who takes out bread from the sky. That's where it comes from. Are you crazy? You're going to tell me, is, I'm going to take a seed. I'm going to put it in the ground. And mysteriously, it's going to grow up. You guys, it's science fiction. Zushtet the Gemara, Zushtet the Midrash. Okay, so says the Midrash. Okay? That's what Midrash is saying. That they were shocked to hear this. It was a miraculous thing. Today we do exact exact opposite. C come on, bread coming from the heavens. Are you crazy? Science fiction, okay? So it doesn't matter where it's coming from. Hashem will give it where it's coming from. So who created technology? God. The secrets that led to the intervention of a microwave and all other miracles of modern technology have existed since creation, just as the elements of black magic did. But the latter were known immediately after creation, and the former took, took uh, over five millennia to discover. The source is the same, Hashem. And the problem with idolatry exists in our times in the form of technology. Is this what life is about? Remember what he said before. What's, uh, we always have to focus on the goal of life. Anything that doesn't get us to the goal of life, namely having uh, a relationship with Hashem, is idolatry. That's how he's defining idolatry. Okay, we can't forget that. Have we been swept off our feet by the powerful wave of pursuit of comfort and pleasure to the extent that we now view that as an end instead of a means? Did God create us to, to have us find a way to lie in bed and be served? So what would you say to that? Noon, Daniel? <laughs> you think so? Think of Sham, create us to find a way to lie in bed and be served. <laughs> no. What's the purpose of life? To, to have a relationship being connected, not just to praise. Idol worship, whether the ancient version or the modern one, does not necessarily mean denial of Hashem as creator and sustainer of the systems of the nature. What it does mean is worship and utilization of those systems in pursuit of practical, comfortable, but empty life. Hmm. 
better reach of God? Oh, so if it's going to do that, then you're utilizing uh, science correctly. Otherwise, but if you just do it so you can have an empty life, mm. then no. Uh, it depends, again, it all depends on what is my kavana. What's my intent? Yeah. This, this last statement. Oh, well, one second, one second. Yeah. Oh, oh. Whatever, uh, you're right. You're not going to God and figure out what's going on. So you don't, you're, 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 you don't think God's going to fix your computer, by the way. Okay, God's not going to come down. He's, God's not the handyman there. But uh, he, he may give you enough intelligence to either, you know, call somebody up or have, turn it off and turn it on. That usually works too sometimes. But it's, uh, but again, all these things, if it's going to be, that is what I see as, the total sum purpose of life, for me to be on the computer, for me to make money, for me to learn. Uh, by the way, if all I'm going to do is learn Torah and not apply it and get closer to Hashem, I've turned Torah into idolatry. So it all depends on what you're doing. Yeah. The statement he makes here that you just read, this describes a very large uh, sector of, of modern society. And as people expect, an easy life. They expect to be served. They expect the handouts all right. the time. And, you know, Correct. Give so, me my movie tickets and my cable TV. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Why we have technology is the constant human struggle to, to make life easier. That you got, yeah. Right, but that's, a, that's yeah. the point. Yeah. It shouldn't just be easier if without, without a goal. Of course, if that's the goal, then you are living an adulterous it's, life. It's replaced. That's his point. Yeah, it's replaced. Right. That's God. his point. You're doing that, you're living an adulterous life. Yeah. I thought adultery is when you, uh, when you pray to a false god. No. That's, what he, I'm try, that's why I said to you, his definition of idolatry is anything that takes you away from the service and the, uh, the goal of serving and connecting to Hashem. Like anything. Definition or his definition? Well, this definition he's giving from other sources. Um, so it's not, he didn't come up with it, but he's using it uh, and to make this work. Okay, so the first step of to fulfilling lo yet, there should be no other gods before you, requires us to ask ourselves, are we pursuing growth and meaning or success and comfort? Are we living in the, for the intended purpose of creation? Or are we spending our precious years on earth trying to manipulate the systems that Hashem instilled in, in, in nature to our advantage? The Torah's warning not to serve a Vodazara is as relevant today as it was in ancient times. It commands us not to become stuck in a life that is practical and comfortable, but meaningless. And again, that's something we have to think about. When we are struggling, when we're working, what's the point? Most people say, I'm working so I can, my kids can have a better life. Okay. I'm not sure that always works because what's how do you define a better life you have to keep the big picture in mind uh, you know if, if that be, there was a guy I used to work with about probably 10 years ago 12 years ago uh, he was married mm -hmm. probably 40 ish had two or three cats at home and no children <laughs> and he, uh, he and his wife established a, a website and his, the, the, his home page is entitled why we work and he went on, they went on lavish month-long trips every around the world right. and published just page after page on the web and pictures. And this is why we work. That's it. Just right. as cats and them. Correct. So again, that seems to be an empty, that seem, that's what we're saying is the vote of the empty yeah. life. Yeah. If I don't have the ultimate connection, if I'm not working on the connection, I don't have it. But if I'm not working on the, my, net, my connection and getting close to Hashem, then I put some other God be, be in front of me, ma namely the God of comfort, the God of money, the God of retirement. I always love the people who say, I'm going for retirement. That's why I'm working for retirement. What are you going to do when you retire? I don't know, but what, I'm doing that. I'm going to do what I want when I retire. And ah. what happens? They retire. And what happens? They have no time because the wife tells them what to do. <laughs> I tell you, I have people who come to me when I was calling for Minion. And the guy said, oh, Rabbi, when I retire, I said, okay. So two years later, he retired. I said, you retired. So how about come to Minion now every day? He said, I would love to, but my wife said to me, oh. what he really wanted to say was, I don't want to come. Okay. But he blamed on everybody else. But it was interesting, but that's how it works. 
So if I'm, if I, but I like to think of, I have a career, or I'm working for my children, or I'm doing this, or I'm doing that. I've put everybody in front of God. And that's what the point of this is here. I can't put anything in front of God. Yes, I should work and make sure my children are taken care of and all these other things that we should do. That's our responsibility in this world. I have to educate my kids so that they will have the right focus. And I have to have the right focus. I can never lose, I can never lose where that goal is. Mm -hmm. And once I do, I've stepped into putting other gods in front of me. It doesn't have to be a god of stone. It could be anything. Mm -hmm. That's going to take me out of that. So here, we're on page 101. So Parsha Toldo contains an account of the different paths that the twins, Yaakov and Esav, set for themselves. The Torah describes Esav as Ish Yodeet Sayed Ish Sadeh, a man who knows hunting, a man of the field, and Yaakov as Ish Tam Yoshev Ohalim, a wholesome man abiding in tents. Esav gravitates to, to the wilds, because he knows how to hunt. His decision is rooted in practicality, not ideology. He chooses a direction in life in which his inborn talents will enable him to succeed. Yaakov, on the other hand, does not make his way to the tents of the yeshiva merely because it comes natural to him as an academic. The driving force behind his decision is his essence. He is wholesome as a truth seeker he makes his way to the yeshiva, where truth and meaning are studied. Later in the parasha, we read that Yitzchak Avinu wanted to bless Esav and not Yaakov. While we know that Esav made a determined effort to mislead Yitzchak into believing that he was a righteous man, the Midrash states that when he would that he would ask Yitzchak questions such as how do we tithe salt, which doesn't require tithing, it is difficult for us to understand how Yitzchak could have been so misled. I mean, what was it? You're uh, an idiot. That's what they're saying. Anybody looks at the story. So, okay, I love my son, and he's my firstborn, and I want to give him everything. So I'm going to think that he's a tzaddik because he asks questions like, how do I tithe salt? Yeah. That to me is not a tzaddik. That to me is a fool. Yeah. Uh, go to school if you don't. You, you can't tithe salt. That's the point. It's such a simplistic question. Wow. That it, shouldn't have been, it shouldn't have been thought of as a great question. Give me a question on the Gemara that I didn't think about. We can talk. But that's a crazy question, really. So some commentators, and that's why you have to ask, what was Yitzchak thinking? Yitzchak thinking. So some commentators explain that Yitzchak Avinu wasn't misled at all. His desire to bless Esav was based on the distinct difference between the brothers. The blessings Yitzchak Avinu was to bestow were for material success. Since Esau was a man of practicality, he would be more. It would be a, he would be a more appropriate recipient of such blessings, right? If I'm in business, you're not going to give me a blessing that I should study well. <laughs> like, what are you doing to me? Why would he give me that? Is I want to do well in business, okay? So that's why. If, since Esau, uh, right? So if not for Rivka Imenu's intervention. Esau and his descendants would have been blessed with the abundance of material success to pursue their practical approach to life in Yaakov, and his descendants would have been successful in spiritual matters only. When Esau realized that Yaakov had received, quote-unquote, his blessings, he flew into a rage, and Yaakov was forced to flee, lest Esau murder him. Upon his return more than two decades later, Yaakov first encountered Esav's guardian angel, followed by the showdown between the two brothers themselves. Yaakov wrestled with Esav's angel, eventually defeating him and releasing him, only upon receiving his blessing. The following morning, Yaakov emerged unharmed from his showdown with the human. Uh, the human Esav, sorry. Shortly thereafter, he received a divine prophecy in which Hashem promised him, Goy ukahal goyim, a nation and a congregation of nations shall descend from you. So it's in his commentary on these words, Rashi first explains the term goy, in his literal sense, a nation. He then adds an interpretation from the Midrash. He says, in other explanations that Hashem promised Yaakov that his children would eventually sacrifice on forbidden makeshift altars like the Gentiles of Goyim in the days of Eliyahu. 
Can you imagine that? God is telling them, your kids are going to mess up. Okay? According to this explanation, the pro- this prophecy alluded to Eliyahu Anavi's rejection of the false prophets of the pagan god Baal in the days of Ahad and Ezevel, Iza- Iza- which is, uh, what's your English? Jezebel. Oh. Okay. Who had managed to lead much of the uh, of Israel, uh, Israel to stray after Baal? Eliyahu Navi challenged that you all know the story. I think it's a famous story. Eliyahu Navi challenged the false prophets of Baal to a public confrontation. He and they were to send Mount Carmel. He would build an altar to Hashem and place an altar an altar, place an offering on it. And the false prophets would build an altar to Baal and place their offering on it. Each one would pray for fire. To consume their offering. Only Eliyahu's prayers were answered. A fire came down from heaven and consumed his sacrifice with the spontaneous cries of Hashem, Hu Elohim, Hashem Elohim, Hashem is the God, Hashem is the God, emanating from the masses that gathered to watch the confrontation. So now, that's the whole background. It's extremely difficult for us to digest why, according to the Midrash cited by Rashi, this momentous display of divine glory would cause Eliyahu to be described as acting like a goy, like a, non, like a heathen, basically. Okay? True, once the base madras was built, the building of the makeshift altars was prohibited, and Eliyahu's altar would have been in violation of this prohibition. But the story is cited by the Talmud as the paradigm example of the concept of Hora'at Sha'a, in which a prophet has the right on a one-time basis to do what otherwise would be prohibited as a fulfillment of eight la'asot la'ashem he'feru toratecha. We say it until it is a time to do for Hashem that they avoided your Torah. We sometimes have to break the Torah to keep the Torah. You got that? Can anybody give me an example of one, one example? Um taking somebody to the hospital on Shabbos? No. No? No. Same thing. Yeah. That's, the reason I'm saying no is because it's part, it part and parcel of the halakha to do that. If somebody's sick, I, it's my obligation yeah, yeah, nefesh, 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 to do that. So it's not that. Okay. It says about the oral Torah, you should not write down the oral Torah. Ah. It's a biblical prohibition ah. to write down the oral Torah. Where does it say that? Uh, it's, in the Torah it says? It's in the Torah. It's, it's in the Torah. The statement that what, alludes to that? You cannot... What? The statement alludes to that? Or specifically? No, it says you. Uh, it's alluding. It's alluding. Okay. It says write down this Torah, ah. and that means only this one, not the oral tradition. Okay, okay so it, it says it plain out. You shouldn't do it. And then, so that's a biblical thing. You know, the whole Talmud, everything we have should not be written down. Mm. What happened, Rabbi Yudha Nasi said, if I don't write it down, if we don't, he got together the whole, uh, the board, <laughs> and he said, if we don't write this down, it's going to be forgotten. Mm. I, what you had to, what you didn't see, eight la sot la shem, if it's time to do for Hashem that they avoided your Torah, they broke the rule in order to save your Torah. That's a classic example of this. The other one is in the Awanavi, where he went, he, he wasn't allowed, we're not allowed to make altars. Can you imagine we're in South Bend, we'll, we'll, take, a, we'll take some sticks. We're, we're in construction anyway right now. Why not tell, tell the, uh, the, the construction crew, by the way, we want to make an altar so we can offer sacrifices. <laughs> What's the problem? You call it a barbecue. I call it a sacrifice. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll sprinkle blood all over the place. We'll have a good time. You're not allowed to do it. The Torah said no. So how could Eliyahu get away with it? Horatia. It was a momentary lapse that he, he said, I need to do it in order to uh, get the people strong again, to take them away from Baal. It was a one-time event. Mm. So it's a combination of Horatia, a one-time event, but it's based on Eight la sot la shem a favorite Yeah. Yeah, there's a difference between an altar. You have to speak up. The difference between an altar and a butcher block is the intention behind it or the. What's a butcher block? A thing you kill an animal. Like the going. The. It's used for cutting up. The oh, butcher block, block, you're going to cut up the animal. You're not killing the animal. They, they take oh, the gun. Like uh, no. They don't do that either. But okay. But the, the intention would be you're. 
how do you do it? I mean, how you're killing it is also there. Yeah. But again, a barbecue versus an altar. An altar is I'm giving it over to Hashem and a barbecue I'm eating for myself. So, or when they would do it, they would give it to their idols. So they would, make an, they would make an altar anywhere. They would just set it up and burn it up or offer it. We're not allowed to do that. We were only supposed to do it in Shiloh or in the Mishkan or ultimately in Ar- or in Yushalayim. Yeah. You can't build an altar unless you... What? You can build an What am, I ha- what am I using it for? What am I building an altar for? It's not an altar, though, yeah? yeah it's, a, it's, a it's a bunch of stones? Yeah, no, that's what it looks like. No, no, no. no so the intro, uh, I would say no to that because I can't, I'm also not allowed to build an idol. I'm not going to pray to the idol, but I can't manufacture it. So if I'm making an altar that somebody ultimately could misuse, um, I, it's uh, lifting Eve. I'm putting a, st- a stumbling block in front of a blind man. So I would say you shouldn't. You probably can't, and you certainly shouldn't. Yeah, if you can't. For the what? Eliyahu. A little while later, but not that day. It took a little while. Yeah, you know that, that's that's true. They would go back. Sure. Because idolatry was a very, still is a very, well, again, our, the idolatry they were doing isn't attractive to us. No. But the way he's presenting it, that it's just a meaningless life, plenty of people in the meaningless life, you look at all your Hollywood stars. Mm-hmm. There are, it's totally, that's why they keep looking, that's why Madonna looked into Kabbalah, because she wanted meaning in her life. She is a success story. She is, was, and always will be a success story. And, but she wasn't, she didn't feel successful. You have other stars who, again, they, they're at the top of the industry. They look towards, what's that other thing? Scientology. Oh, yeah. I mean, she But that's what they look towards and they think, oh, okay, fine, it makes sense to me, why not? Why are they doing that? Because they need something. They need something more than what they have. The parties and everything else that they have, again, they are the top of the food chain when it comes to that. They have everything that we consider success, and they're miserable. And yet you have this Yushalmi in Yushalayim who has nothing to his name. He's living in squalor. He's poor. He has all the kids running around. He's the happiest guy in the world. Are you crazy? What, you disconnect? No, because he has a connection with God. So he acts like he has the world. And these people who have billions of dollars, shows, everything else, they're looking, what, what do I do? What, what I, I need something, I need something. They're on drugs. They're in and out of, what do you call those places where they go in and out of it? Uh, what, rehab. rehab. They're in and out of rehab. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What are you, crazy? Uh. You have everything. What else do you want? They want to feel something. And that's why they, again... Their goal, if they reached it, and yet it was, it was a waste. It was illusionary. Illusory, sorry, illusory. Yeah. Right. So Say it again? They, they went back to idolatry, so then why was Eliyahu still allowed to break that? They were just no, no, again, for that moment, they oh. didn't go back. For that moment, they said, Hashem is Hashem who well him. So they recognized Hashem. And the, uh, Jezebel says, one second, Jezebel says, uh, don't kill him today. Wait till tomorrow. Wait till tomorrow. Why? Why till tomorrow? Because there's already an interpretation, but mm. the reason is because tomorrow the people will forget what happened. Mm. And then we'll go back, and then I can kill him. Right now he's a hero. <laughs> don't touch him. Yeah. Uh, what if you go to a bush of boxes where you cut animals up, cut dead animals up on him, but someone with a really, really fancy bush of boxes, someone that thinks that has an altar? That's not your problem. If, if you build something that's, if you take a butcher block and somebody turns that into something else that you, that, you know, you can't, you can't figure out all the people, all the Michigan is out there. If you go to, um, when I was in Moncton, uh, New Brunswick, so they, I walked into what the chapel and they, what we have, we have Sabima, okay? They call that the altar. I said, Okay, call it what you want. Yeah. I'm not responsible for the for for the Mishigasan. 
So I built it for the Shem Shemayim. They take it and they corrupt it. I can't do much about that. But if I build an altar with the stones and everything else, trying to show what it looked like so I know what not to do, that's no good. I, I, again, I'm caused, somebody may use it incorrectly. I built it to show what it was. So it clearly was for the Mizbeach. I just no, so I can't use it, that's all. So you shouldn't do it. Okay. Uh, so perhaps this Midrash is expressing something fundamental about the Jewish personality. Esav chooses his steps in reaction to the needs to the needs that arise at the moment. Esav murders when it suits his needs, yet discusses the tithe when he finds it necessary to impress his father. His father. Yaakov lives according to his principles, come, come what may. Even the divine concept of harad sha'ah, this, uh, this is, uh, which is, again, ruling for the moment, <coughs> necessary, though it is in the times like Eliyahu, seems foreign to the Jewish personality, foreign enough to be referred to as a Gentile-like act. Uh, like act. Perhaps it was the surrender of Esau's angel to Yaakov that enabled his descendant Eliyahu to fulfill the gentle, uh, Gentile like directive of eight la sot la shem is uh, sometimes you have to break the law in order to ma- maintain the law. Thanks to Yaakov's victory, it became possible for his descendants to turn an otherwise forbidden altar into a means of historic kiddush Hashem. Again, we can't constantly do this, but if the prophet, and that's only a prophet who can do this, uh, thinks it's necessary, fine. In our long and often bitter history, Jews have been at their best when challenged. Hidden strengths are reawakened with the very thought of having to surrender to circumstances. Just think of uh, Greek times. Think of uh, the, the Germans uh, the, when we're in the Holocaust. These Jews who decide, or even before, uh, the ones who were in Russia, to be, who became the Zionists. Again, some of them are doing it, the Shem Shemayim, some of them are doing it for other reasons, the Shem Socialism. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's, uh, you have these things where there's hidden strengths. Do away, uh, or away, or, uh, so that's what you said. Hidden strengths are reawakened at the very thought of having to surrender to these circumstances. When threatened with forced conversions and similar challenges, simple Jews have become stubborn, and proud with a rekindled spirit of Yisrael uh, Sabah, our grandfather Israel, and displayed incredible mysterious nefesh, giving over of their souls, allowing them to be tortured and killed rather than surrender. By the way, I want, you know, for all those people who did die in the Holocaust, who were murdered in the Holocaust, many of them were not religious. Many of them may not have been Jewish either, but uh, because of how they were counting Jews. But let's assume that 99%, 99.9% were Jewish for this, okay? If they weren't from, they didn't know why they were dying. A, non, a, a secular Jew who's not connected, except that he's Jewish, really doesn't have the connection, doesn't have this thought of, well, obviously this is best for my neshama, and I'm going to just say Shammai Israel walking in, and whatever Hashem has in mind, he has in mind. By the way, I don't know of how many religious people have such tremendous emuna that what's about to happen is for the best. I'm about to be killed. Obviously I did some avera, what did I do wrong, and do tshuva. I, I have a real problem believing that myself that people go through that chesper and nefesh, maybe they do, maybe everybody does, I don't know. But, and I hope that, hopefully they did, hopefully they used it properly, and hopefully, God forbid, something like that, you know, anytime something bad happens, we should use it properly. But still in all, it's, it's hard to believe that they did that. And that's what's going on here, but we didn't give up our Judaism. How easy would it be for Jews to hide their Judaism? Everybody in this room could hide their Judaism like that. Think about it. Change your name, shave your beard. One of these days you can keep your beard. Okay? Okay? Keep it right, if you like your beard, keep it. But think about that. You, you, st- you don't say Zustate anymore, you just speak the King's English, if you will. And we all can assimilate, and we can look. We drop our names, although our names are really aren't Jewish anyway. Well, yes, okay. No, Blatt's also not, not Jewish. 
Orange skin. Okay, fine. You're the only one who has a Jewish name here. The red, uh, Neville's not Jewish either. Okay, it's Neville is from German. So all these names, they're not Jewish. We don't have, we're not called uh, Fabu and Shlomo outside. You know, we, that's our hidden names. That's our real names here. But on, in the outside world, we use our slave names. Fine. So when we're using our slave names, nobody knows who we are. Unless they have a name like Stein or something like that, Goldberg. You know, we can figure out, oh, they must be Jewish. So I have Jewish blood. But for the most part, they're not. Okay. And even those people, they could hide themselves. We don't look any different than anybody else in reality. We all, everybody wears glasses today. <laughs> Think about it. I grow my hair out. I get a crew cut. We can all look different. It's, and we can all can eat trafe. Remember, to save our lives, why not? So we can all do it. We could hide. And yet, when somebody says something, we all get on stage and say, no. The fact that I want to assimilate when I want to, Fine. But if when you tell me to assimilate, uh uh uh. When you endanger Israel, suddenly we all get together. We all make a big noise. Suddenly. Because you, the outsider, tried to get in our, into our face. And that we don't accept. That's what he's saying here. Amazing thing. It rekindles our spirit. On his way to the confrontation with Asaf. Yaakov sent Esav a message stating, Im Lavan Garti. I have sojourned with Lavan. Rashi's comments that the numerical value of Garti sojourned is 613, the same as the number of the mitzvah in the Torah. Yaakov was sending Esav an implied message. I lived with Lavan, but I didn't compromise my standards. We tend to understand that what Yaakov meant was despite that despite living with their devious and wicked uncle, Lavan, he had not compromised on his principles. Rav Yitzchak Hunter offered a novel perspective. He said that Yaakov meant that because he was living with Lavan, he was extremely careful in observing the mitzvot. And a hostile environment sparks within the Jew a desire to stand up for his values with even, great, with even greater diligence. And it's true. It's so true. When you put it, when you start yelling at us, that's when everybody wants to do the right thing. <laughs> because we're going to show you when we want to, like I said, when I want to break the law, that's my business. But you can't, don't tell me to break the law. Look at this white of the, the fight of the Maccabees, the Hellenists versus the, the other Jews. Again, people got upset. Why they get upset historically? Because the Greeks put an idol in the temple. And they said, whoa, 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 that you can't do. Take away circumcision, take away Shabbos, but don't put, don't change my my temple. Leave my temple alone. <laughs> that they got upset about. Who did they put there? The the Greeks. The Greek. They were upset that the Greeks did that. Right, right, right. That's they what I'm saying. Have they were, if they would have done, who cares? Let's take out the mechitza. Let's do everything. We can do it. We can count women. We can count anything. We can count Torahs. But once the non-Jew tells us to do that, whoa, whoa, whoa. Who are you? We have to do it the right way. And what's the right way? Orthodox. They all jump on that bandwagon. There's a story that they wrote about the Mechitza. There was a conservative show. This is where the whole, it's a court case. Oh. The saint, it's called The Sanctity of the Synagogue, the book. It's called The Sanctity of the Synagogue. The guy was not from who was writing the story. And what happened was, the show was conservative. He was in a conservative show. And they it had mechitz because of the, it was originally an Orthodox show. And so they wanted to take it down, and he got upset. Uh -huh. Don't change my show! Uh -huh. And he got the rabbi seat. Then he went to the Orthodox. Where's the mechitz coming from? He got all the proof that is from the Torah, and so on and so forth. So he went to court, oh, and he got it. By the way, he saved the show. Uh, it, the mechitz have remained in the shul, but still, he didn't. He wasn't shomer Shabbos. What do you care? If I remember the story correctly, he wasn't anything. He, he but he, that he fought for. Because how dare you tell me what to do? Okay. So you have those sort of things. Either it's, it's somebody who wants to fight with you, or uh, again, Saint Tivis, if you look it up, Saint Tivis the synagogue. Okay, it was in the 1950s. This leads us to a disturbing question. We'll stop on this question. Above, we learned that the Chinuch 
uh, defines the mitzvah of lo yihye, again, you should not have got any gods before God, as a prohibition of the belief in any power other than Hashem, even if we realize that the ultimate power is subservient to Him. We explained that the underlying characteristic of Avodah Zarah is the worship and manipulation of systems in nature to find practical solutions for problems, rather than focusing on the purpose of our existence. Yet we Jews live practically and pragmatically. We deal in commerce to earn a livelihood. We see doctors when we're sick. In short, we seem to live a life, we seem to live within the framework of the practical world. Is If there is truly something evil about seeking practical, natural solutions for living in this world, how is it that Jews lead lives that are so practical and pragmatic? Yeah. That's the question. How is that Jews leave lives that's so practical and pragmatic? You have to come back next week. Okay.